I, I'm just telling you that everyone I've worked with who's had that job cracks at some point. The, yeah. the worst thing you can do is absolutely reassure me that it won't <laughs> happen to you, you know. And two months later, three o'clock in the morning, in the emergency room at the county hospital, I hear him screaming down the hall. Welcome to the Dr. Gill Show. This is where we talk about medical matters that matter to you. My guest today is Dr. Richard Mellett. Welcome to the show, Richard. Thank you. Richard is a friend of mine. He's a colleague. Richard is a cardiothoracic surgeon. And anybody who knows anybody uh, who knows anything about cardiothoracic surgery uh, always refers you very highly, Richard. You have a fantastic reputation. Thank you. Yeah, you also, I think, were on my interview committee 18 years ago or something when, oh, I, was, was I? when I was first coming on board. Oh, okay. And, and, uh, and uh, so I, I met you peripherally, and I, I've known you for uh, 18 years now. And not all, only are you a fantastic cardiothoracic surgeon, but you're a great storyteller, Richard. Uh, some will disagree with you. <laughs> and I when, I, had, when I start to tell the same story again, and they go, and the eyes all roll, and they go, oh, yeah, I, yeah, yeah, I've said again, that one already. Not again, yeah. <laughs> um, but we've had many delightful conversations, and I will admit I've probably been a minute or two late to go into surgery because we've been in the lounge chatting, and uh, I've not want I've wanted to stay till the end of one of uh, yeah. uh, your fantastic stories. So. We've talked about the particulars of cardiothoracic surgery and valve replacements and bypasses and bleeding cadavers with your uh, with your good partner Joss Fernandez. Yes, and I'm going to leave all that technical stuff with that episode because okay. today we're going to talk about fun stuff that's not technical. Okay. So let me just mention that uh, you went to Notre Dame undergraduate. I went to the University of Michigan, so we were big. T well, they were always independent, but we were always big football rivals. Oh, yeah. Notre Dame and Michigan. Yeah. Then you went to medical school at uh, St. Louis University in St. Louis, and then you did your residency and your training, for the most part, in Emory University. That's in Atlanta, right? Correct. Right. So Atlanta is a big city with typical big city problems uh -huh. that includes bullets and knives and occasional violence and uh, dangerous situations where uh, a cardiothoracic surgeon in training might get uh, uh, brought into the action, well, you could say. Well, that was, uh, when you're looking, that was certainly a draw. Is that, a draw, correct. Yeah, that there's, uh, uh, that there was a lot of, uh, Trauma, you know, in particular, penetrating trauma, which is most of, many times requires surgery. Yeah, well, they high speed missiles is one of the yeah. one of the uh, vernacular for bullets. Correct. And well, uh, the low speed are easier to take care of. <laughs> the, the high speed are far messier. Uh, yeah, but the uh, or high velocity, but the uh, uh, and knives were interesting too. So. Uh, and, yeah. it's, and, and actually, the interesting, the patterns we saw, when it was nice out, people got shot. And when it was raining, people got stabbed because they were in close proximity. So. Amazing. Amazing. Yeah. And, and it, it might sound uh, kind of uh, sick or gratuitous, but in fact, when you're a medical student and you're looking at residencies, you look for residencies where you're going to see Right. A lot of pathology or a lot of trauma and whatnot. And yeah. uh, it, it may sound, counter, sound counterintuitive. And if obviously we don't want anything ill to befall someone. No, but no. if we're going to get trained yes. <laughs> to do these things, you need the closer to a war zone, the better training you're going to have, particularly for a surgery and the related specialties. You know, that's, that's your thought process going into it. Uh, <laughs> right. You're excited and you're young and you don't need very much sleep. Right. And uh, uh, but it it does wear on you uh, personally. Yeah. You know, if you're not a sociopath or what? Yeah. Yes. If you are a sensitive thinking 
feeling human being. It does does wear on yeah, you. Yeah, it, it it it's it's hard. It, it's emotionally hard. Yeah, because uh, it's amazing what people can do to each other with yeah. vehicles and weapons. Yeah. Uh, now I did my fellowship training in Newark, New Jersey. Oh, okay. In the early nineties, and yeah. it was at the time the carjacking capital of the world. Right. Shortly right. after, I think it was Mogadishu you know, in Africa or something. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it was, I mean, it, it was very violent. Yes. And I remember every year, we used to have x-rays on film, Richard. You probably remember there oh, were acetate, I, big films. I, I remember that very, very much so. And once a year in the cafeteria lunchroom, big lunchroom for uh. a big medical school, they would have these viewers. They were light light boxes, and you'd put the things, and they were roll. They could roll them, and you could have yeah. about a dozen of these big films. Yeah, and it would have like the films of the year once a year at lunch, and you'd have one. It was you know, shotgun pellets all sure. over somebody, sure. or an axe sticking out of someone's yeah. head, or a, you know, it is all the things that. Uh, that people unfortunately do to each other um, uh, in, the, in these places. It, it is very sad. So what would motivate one, uh, Richard, or motivate you in particular, uh, to go into a surgical specialty? Uh, I was uh, just a very mechanical person mm. uh, growing up, uh, cars and other, you know, if, if, if you could take it apart and put it back together, I had done it. So you had a apti um, natural aptitude for that right. and good hands, probably. Right, and but you don't know about the good hands until you get there to the. Okay. You know, uh, but the, uh, but I was constantly uh, working on vehicles. If if I wanted to go somewhere, I had to fix the car so I could go there. So you were not born so, into money. No, uh, <laughs> no, it, it was uh, a beat up old car that I had to keep running. And, uh, and in, as an example, in college, I didn't have a car because uh, I couldn't afford it. But uh, I would fix other people's cars on the contingency that I would be able to borrow the car at a later date. So, ah. so I, I actually got away with a fair amount uh, by keeping other people's cars while I was in college running. Kind of a barter system. And, uh, well, yeah, it was like, you know, I'll, I'll fix that. I know what it is. But you know, if but you, you, you're gonna owe me a couple of lens. <laughs> if I ever you know, call you for a yeah. favor, you well, the odd have part to you, do it. The odd part is you'd make a date with some uh, 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 a young lady, and you couldn't tell her what you were going to pick <laughs> her up in. <laughs> you'd have any to, vehicle. And, you know, there weren't. It wasn't texting or cell phones. You couldn't. <laughs> you, you couldn't warn her. You call her dorm room and. Tell a roommate, I'm going to be in a, a black pickup truck. You know, and, uh, uh, just tell her, you know, but most of the part of the time, I knew I would have to get out and go in uh, to pick her up. And uh, right. because a lot of, I just did not know what I was going to be driving. Uh, <laughs> you know, and, 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 and the worst case scenario was the bus. So uh, the bus? I'd take the bus to go pick her up. Oh. You know? <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness! Yeah. You well, be, you, you do what you have to do. You do yeah. what you have to do. Yeah, man, man. Now, I knew I had aptitude for surgery because I operated on a, a stuffed animal of mine when I was five. Yeah, I did a vertical midline laparotomy. I had already been studying sewing and embroidery. It's like, uh, what is a boy studying this? Well, I knew how to sew. Yeah, and uh, I was already fixing things myself when I was a little kid. I knew I wanted to be a surgeon when I was five. Yeah. Well, you know, it, it, being a doctor sounds sounds uh, very interesting mm. uh, until you're 18 years old. And someone oh. says, and someone says to you, uh, you're going to go to four years of college, four years of medical school, uh, five to eight years of additional training. Right. And Brutal then, training. And then you'll be able to do what you want to do. Right, you'll be and in your at eighteen. 30s. That sounded like a terrible idea. Sounds ludicrous. Right. So I, I, I had been on that doctor track uh, in high school, uh, and had done. Uh, I had gotten a scholarship from the American Heart Association and things like that, and and I was on that track until I at eighteen. I realized this is just a 
terrible idea. Yeah. And then uh, you do four years of college, and you, I was an engineer, mechanical engineer, and I got a job, and I didn't like it, you know, and it wasn't mm. it wasn't me. And you start looking around, going, well, you know, you're still alive for that period of time. You're, you know, you're. If you want to do what you're slated, what you think you ought to do, right? Sometimes you have to pay the dues, you know? yeah. And and uh, uh, and so, it, if I went from not wanting to spend the time to spending the most amount of time, you know, and right? So between. Between when I started medical school and, and finished training, it was 13 years. So Yeah. People don't realize that. People graduate from high school and they're done. That's right. Oh, <laughs> if you're going to be a doctor, you're not even half that's, done. That's not a bad thing. Right, yeah. right. It's not a bad thing. No. And, and I yeah. have people in the trades and, and, and do, I do very yeah. important, honorable work. And I'm not putting anybody down oh, for no, it. Oh, no. It's it's not we, a bad thing. We need us all. We, yeah. we all were. It takes a village. Um, but it's just, it is a, a fact that at, at high school, at year 12, you're not even half done as a doctor, and the easy years are behind you. Correct. Yes. Those are the easy yeah. years. Uh, yeah, that, it's much more brutal than that. Yeah. So, I mean, the, the studying seems like it should have been tough, but when you're presented in a clinical situation and you're training, that's when things get rough, physically rough, emotionally rough, uh, yeah. and, and things don't always go as planned. Uh, and... Uh, uh, so it was, it's, it's, you know, it, it, every part of it is important uh, yeah. and it's different. Um, yeah. And do you think the motivations uh, of trainees or, or, you know, future doctors are, are changing? Do you, and well, cause, cause it, it's certainly it, the, not for the money. The, I mean, the, the training you, has changed people. Well, I, I don't know. I don't know anybody who doesn't like saying that they're a doctor uh, yeah, the prestige is high. I mean, where, where, right. where do they rank? Doctor uh, always comes above lawyer. Yes, which and they always tend to get even. But uh, <laughs> yeah, 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 not putting that. Some of my best friends are lawyers. <laughs> but the uh, uh, the motivation uh, for me was it suited me, you know. Yeah, and and uh, and it certainly financially. Uh, I mean, uh, thirteen years was a long time. You know, and and uh, uh, you're putting a lot of your life on hold for that period of time, and, and frequently and, going uh, deeply into debt. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But the, you know, you you have to be generally. I I got in trouble when I was a medical student. I was giving tours to pr prospective students, and somebody asked me about being a medical student. And I said, if you don't like it, it this would suck. You know, yeah, right. And they, and they reported that back to the dean's office, and I got called in to explain myself. And for I said, committing truth, I love it. For, being for, honest, yeah. Don't you know? <laughs> don't do this just because you want to call yourself doctor. Do it because yeah. it suits you. It's because it's what you want to do. Right. You want to do the work. Not the title is isn't worth what's involved. You know, and uh -huh. uh, uh, there's much easier ways to get by in this world. Uh, you sure are. You could have a podcast. You know, That's right. right? <laughs> That's right. As I get older, I'm in my early 60s now, Richard, and yeah. I, I don't know how long I can operate and a, at a top level. Do I have 5, 10, 15, 20 years in me? I don't know. Yeah. God yeah. knows. So uh, I have this. It's this, certainly time limited, you know. Yeah. Every day is precious. We only have so much time on this earth. And, uh, you know, it, it occurred to me a year or two ago before this, I started this podcast that I had access to talent yeah. And stories and backstories uh, such as yours. And um, I've really been looking forward to uh, interviewing you about stories. So let's go. And now we've kind of talked about your motivation, what one's motivation might be to be a doctor, or particularly a surgeon, to the training you went through. I think you're a little older than I am, not much. Uh, but 62. The you're 62? Yeah. We're exactly the same age. Wow. Yeah. So the training that we went through it, it, it may never have be, re, be repeated. They've, they've yeah. made laws that limit the, the amount of hours uh, you can work. Uh, attitudes have changed, uh, many for the better. I'm not saying it was better then, but it was different. Right. Well, we did, uh, for example, when I was on trauma in Atlanta, 
We we started off. We were, we did three months of every other night. Every other night. And you were on for 24 hours and then off for 24 hours. Okay. Now, is this when you're still doing the general surgery? This is general surgery. All right. So you did five years of general surgery before several years of cardiothoracic. So you're right. on trauma. You're a resident. Yeah. You're there 24 hours. Well, your shift ended at 24 hours. Right. And then it took you two or three hours to clean everything up. Right. And then you'd go and you would sleep, you know, for 10 hours. Right. Because uh, you hadn't slept much in the previous 24. And then you would come back and do it again. And do it again. Yeah. Not much time for that social life? No, no. The laundry. No. I just remember my laundry. I had time to do laundry maybe every two or three weeks. Yeah. Yeah. And you, a little and, time. And, and then, uh, for, as an example, I uh, one of the jobs within the team was particularly difficult. And... Uh, uh, I told, I would always tell the guy who had that job that uh, this is really difficult. Three months of this will uh, stress you to a point where you will break in, in some fashion. Mm. In, some, in fashion. some fashion. And, uh, and I, 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 would, I was trying to give them, let them off the hook when they stressed out. When they, and they reach their max, uh, their, right, and right. The stress, they say, okay, you're right, human, join right. the club. And I, and I had one guy who was a few years uh, older than me who had gone to medical school late, and he said, I, I've been through all kinds of things. I, I won't break. And, yeah. uh, and I said, uh, I, I'm just telling you that everyone I've worked with who's had that job cracks at some point. And wow. Gets 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 a little uh, stressed out. And, okay. And uh, uh, it, it won't happen to me. Abs the the the, yeah. the worst thing you can do is absolutely reassure me that it won't <laughs> happen to you. You know. And, oh, and boy. so and so I uh, I said okay. And two months later, three o'clock in the morning, in the emergency room at the county hospital. I hear him screaming down the hall. And uh, I was in a rolling chair, and I wheeled over, and I stuck my head, and I could see down the hall. And he's he's yelling at uh, a patient's family member. I don't know what, why. You know, just totally off off the hook. Okay. And, and I'm looking, and <laughs> I'm just watching this thing. And Check that box. I, I'm worried, a little worried it's going to get physical based on his gestures. You know, and uh, it's around 3 a.m. We haven't been, right. no sleep, you know. And he, uh, and all of a sudden he stops. And he's looking at this guy. And he turns and he sees my head <laughs> There he is. <laughs> ding, ding. <laughs> and, I, and I wave to him, you know. I just, uh -huh. give, I give him a little wave. And he goes, and his head sinks. Oh. And I roll the day. I, I, I knew <laughs> I'd. I knew I had him in check. Point made. I didn't have to do anything yeah, at this point. Right. I just wheeled the chair back to the desk, and I went back to doing what I was doing. You know, and I didn't hear any more yelling. You know, so, but it was, uh, it was, uh, it, it, you know, a job that takes you to the point where you break, where you lose your cool, uh, no matter how cool you are, you know, and, uh, uh and it was, it, you know, it, it teaches you a lot about yourself. Now, is it right. is that really necessary to to get to that point to be pushed to that point? I, I I don't think that that's really necessary in training. It was definitely a part of it. Uh, yeah, but it was uh, it, it taught you a lot about yourself going through something like that. So uh, yeah, and, and doing things when you are half dead from lack of sleep certainly develops yeah. almost a mental, I'm going to call it a muscle memory. Yeah. Um, and sometimes I rely on my training when, when things are hairy, I, I don't have the most stressful job as far as uh, sleep deprivation or anything, but I can rely on, on my training. But the question is, did I make errors back then when, when I was getting my muscle memory, you know, cutting my teeth, did I make errors then? Am I robbing Peter to pay Paul now? I don't know. Right. Well, the, the, the other thing that I, uh, the thing that we had uh, is, uh, is it's become a little too much shift work now. 
in my view, uh, my personal view. Sure. Uh, when I uh, trained, uh, there was a continuity to it where you had somebody who was really sick that you were taking care of and you were going through the whole thing. You didn't, you didn't do 12 hours and then sign out. You did 36 hours. Right. And there's something about that that was beneficial that you're, that you don't have an out. Um, whereas one of my, one of my concerns now is that the, the younger generation coming up doesn't have that con continuity. Uh, they, they're not used to delivering care in that manner. Uh -huh. You know, they do a certain number of hours and then they they sign out. Mm -hmm. um, now that maybe it's, it's a lot, certainly a lot more humane, but there's a, there's a toughness to it that, uh, and, a and there was learning that happened, uh, in the process of going through a, so, taking care of somebody who was really sick. Yeah. Seeing them uh, through. Yeah. Not just yeah, doing the surgery, yeah. but then you've got the post-op, you've got the, the complications, yeah, you have right. the family, yes, the social yeah. issues. Right. Well, I mean, I loved pediatric surgery, but I couldn't do the families because they were right. They were so emotional. They're a mess, uh, uh, as I as and anyone I, not, would not, be. Yeah. Totally, totally reasonable. Yeah, understandable. I, I'm the same way about my kids. Sure. Uh, you know, I, I had, I was very interested in pediatric cardiac surgery at one point in my life, uh, for, and it was very intellectual because it's a very, it's a the physiology is just so. Uh, unusual in comparison to normal and that training is another year of fellowship it's right a, one more it's another uh, year uh, uh, yeah for, after uh, you're a certified cardiothoracic yeah, at, at, at emory it's uh, it's a total of four years so it's three years plus one and, of cardiothoracic uh, yeah after general surgery right so right. i started off interested i was a student uh i was a general surgery resident i was gravitating that way i was following the you know you know, outside, I was, I, I introduced myself to the pediatric surgeons, and I would watch stuff if I could. Um, and then I had children, you know, and and I went and, you know, you don't think about this when you're watching an interesting case, married but not with children, and then when when I actually came to do it and was helping with cases. It was a totally, entirely different thing when, um, and, and somehow every child that they put on the table in the operating room looked somehow like mine. Oh. You know? And, and I, I couldn't, yeah. I, and I emotionally, I was too stressful. And sure. I, I went to my, my boss, somebody who trained me, a tremendously brilliant guy who had trained in pediatrics and adult. And was nationally recognized. <coughs> Excuse me. I went to him and I said, "You used to do this," <clears throat> and he knew that I was interested. And actually, had put me in a situation that would benefit me more exposure. Sure. And I went to him and said, "What? When? Uh, what? Uh, why did you stop doing children?" And he said, "The uh, third time my ulcer bled. Uh, oh. I knew it was time for me to stop." You know, and I went, mm. Mm. you know." Uh, you know, somebody you look up to, somebody that is brilliant and talented, and he and and he admits that it was too much. You know, and and uh, wow. so uh, it's not just the ability or the intellect; <clears throat> you have to be able to handle the stress of it. Um, yeah. So compartmentalize it, it without becoming. Uh, yeah. You know. Well, there, we, we've all emotionless. we've all met guys who are brilliant surgeons who yeah. are uh, a bit. Uh, unemotional, yeah, a little bit detached, you know. Or and, frank assholes, <clears throat> you know. Yeah. It, it, you know. But it did, it, and, but I understand that better now than I did when I was right coming up, you know. Right. Yeah. So you did your general surgery, did a lot of trauma. Now, when did you start getting involved in, in more of the homicides and the? Uh, well, just the, the, <clears throat> we did uh, we did a lot of trauma. At uh, the county hospital, yeah, and um, the uh, one, one as an example, uh, one day I walked into the in, into the 
emergency room, I was on trauma. And I look down the hall, and there's a ramp where the ambulances pull in and they unload. And there was a, I recognized a homicide detective. We've talked about this before, but there's a, <clears throat> at the time, there was a group of homicide detectives in Atlanta that would all wear hats. Fedora hats. F fedoras. And they, were, they called themselves the, the hat squad. <clears throat> and I look down to the ramp. And I see, I see a homicide detective that I recognize. And I, you get to know these guys after a while. Oh, well, <laughs> yeah, well they, they want you to bring evidence to them, such as a bullet you remove. Right. And, they, and there's a charge nurse standing by, near the radio, and, and the radio's not going off. You know. And I walk up to the charge nurse, and I said, uh, uh, where's the, where's the you know, gunshot wound? <clears throat> and she goes, I don't know what you're talking about. And I said, there's a, she goes, why do you think there's a gunshot wound? I go, because there's a homicide detective standing about down on the ramp, you know. Uh, and and his office was about two blocks away, and I knew that he walked down. He uh, got the call that there was a gunshot, and he walked down. And uh, and then right then the radio went off. They're bringing in a gunshot wound. <laughs> so he was, he was. And she's pretty, looking at me like I'm insane. Because <laughs> you know, I just recognized him. And, uh. <laughs> and they, they come wheeling in, and all the excitement starts, you know. And and she's looking at me like, "How the heck, how did you know?" And uh, <laughs> and I was like, "Well, I just saw him standing down there. I knew there was something happening." The know? Hat Squad was there. The Hat Squad, and uh, uh, yeah, and he 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 wants to interview the guy while we're doing CPR, and I was like, you <laughs> get, "You're going to have to wait a few minutes." You you get exposed to a lot of things, and uh, you see situations, and. After a while, it starts to affect you. You know, you start to get a little cynical. Cynical, jaded. Oh, yeah. Put up the, the protective blinders or whatnot. Right. So you got to know these detectives. So what kind of things would you see, Richard? What kind of things that le left a big impression on you? Well, I, I remember a young man came in, shot in the head, and he was essentially, uh, uh, he was dying. And um, <clears throat> and the detective came and tried to ask me if he was going to be able to answer any questions. I said, no, he's going, he's dying. And, uh, uh, and it took, his wife was out of town. The and, detective's wife or the, no, no, the victim? The, the victim's wife was out of town. So I'm uh, assessing <clears throat> his medical condition, in that, and I tried to actually not I learned not to want to know too much about what had happened. You know, huh. you, 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 I, I don't want to know why he got shot in the head. Uh, I, I just, I just want to deal with uh, his injury, you know, and and not interest, not particularly. You, you lose interest sometimes in the, in that story. You want to emotionally separate yourself from it. And and I would stop. I would I would stop asking certain questions. So you learn not to ask. Gee, well, if a prisoner, why? if a prisoner came in, I didn't want to know why they were in prison. Um, if if a uh, if somebody got shot, I didn't know. Want, I didn't want to know what they were doing when they got shot. You know, right, right. I, I didn't right, want to. Right. I didn't want to know if they were the, on occasion, the person who instigated the problem. The carjacker got shot. Right. And I would prefer just to address the injury and not so much the uh, how they got themselves into trouble, you know. Yeah, but apparently in the emergency room, you can have two rival gang members that just yeah. injured each other, almost killed. And right. now they're in bays, now bay right one and bay two yeah. right next to each other. And between, and they're going to try to still keep killing each other. Well, <laughs> the, 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 oh, the, the people around me... The people who ended up at, in the trauma rooms uh, where I was, they seem to have some sort of a truce uh, on hospital grounds. Okay, like we, a sanctuary, we, like a, in church. You don't, you don't. Yeah, uh, we. It, that may it may Ill. be totally different now, but at the time, we didn't worry so much about somebody coming after somebody if they hadn't finished what their well. intention was. 
and, and uh, every once in a while we got warned that there might be something like that. Uh -huh. But but for the most part, we didn't worry about uh, violence on on hospital grounds. And there's uh, one of the one of the guy one of the, the fellows who taught me, especially when I was beginning my you know training. Uh, I, I was struggling with a case. But you said you were on a line. What do you mean? Well, I mean, I, I was kind of going through, like, starting there, and then, uh, and uh, you know, what we were exposed to. Um, but, you know, personally, there was, a, there was a moment when I was doing a case where uh, I was still very much learning. And uh, this was in a private hospital, uh, and an uh, older fellow that was teaching me. Okay, an older attending. Old, older, cool. older private practice was was allowing me to do some of the surgery, and I was struggling. And the, I was struggling because uh, the nature of uh, the patient had some varices, which are very fragile veins that are under high pressure. And right, yeah, of, of the esophagus? Well, it was actually the on the spleen. On the spleen, so uh, the, big dilated, fragile veins around the spleen that can bleed. Right. So the like, the uh, the uh, I'm sure that this is handled completely differently now, but at the time we would take the spleen out when the vein the, the spleen vein was clotted, it would the, the artery would still be pumping blood into the spleen, oh. and it would develop all these huge collaterals coming out of it. And they were large, fragile, and high flow. And uh, and the treatment for that was to remove the spleen. Okay. I would suspect now they probably would, an interventional radiologist would clot the artery, and then you would take out the spleen, you know, which would right. greatly simplify the process. We talked to Mac, Max yeah. Lassinger just recently uh, about that. Right. So uh, at the time, though, what we did was we just took the spleen out. And I was, uh, I had experience taking out spleens, but this was far more difficult because of the, and, and, and there was bleeding, and I was struggling, and I was getting unnerved, and he could, he could see that, and he, I'll never forget this, he looked at me and he said, boy, it ain't you who's bleeding. Just ha, it ain't you who's bleeding. Just settle down. And, ah. Uh, and, do your job. Soldier. And I, the funny part about that is that, you know, you, you we all encounter bleeding. It's part of our, it's part of our job, yep. right? And uh, and and it and it can be and it can be quite unnerving, you know. Oh yeah. Uh, In fact, there's only two fields, Richard, where we have what's called audible bleeding, where yeah. it's so heavy you can hear it. Yeah. One of them's trauma surgery. And one of them is obstetrics. Yes, yes. Well, uh, where I trained, they did a lot of, uh, it was one of the, at the time, it's one of the places where portal hypertension surgery was commonplace there at Emory. Emory, and that's at when the, the liver is damaged, usually from heavy drinking for a Cirrhosis long time. Cirrhosis results in uh, high pressure in the veins uh, going through the liver they develop collaterals to the esophagus and other places. So the blood can't get through the liver. It needs to find another way around. Right. These little veins become big veins. And they're very fragile. And they're very and it's the same, fragile. It's the same problem I was describing with the spleen in this case. Yeah. And uh, the uh, uh, and, the, and there was definitely the potential for audible bleeding in those yeah. cases. And, uh, and the guys who were good at that were were not frazzled when when it happened they were uh, yeah they, they were they were they would hold themselves very much together focused it, it's kind of like you know you, you hear you, you hear them talk about police officers and they uh, when they're shooting some people run towards it and some people run away I'll run away you know and in surgery it's when there's audible bleeding some people move back and some people move forward you know yeah. and, and you if if you're if you find yourself responsible for that person you want to be one of those people who moves forward or right. moves towards it 
and yeah, I'll, to, I'll, to deal with the problem. I'll take responsibility. Instead I'll of backing away from it. Yeah. 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 But, that, I, but I remember him, I can still hear it in my head where uh, I see something that has got me a little frazzled or a little, you know, worried. And I think in my head, remember, you're not the one who's bleeding. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take that pearl home with me too because um, do some difficult things. Yeah, it's, we, we all face a moment where you're like, is that going to stop? You know, I mean, it, that, that's, uh, you know, I, I, I remember an, an internal medicine quote uh, where a guy said, if it wasn't for bleeding, we'd all be surgeons. <laughs> you know, that kind of gets to the different personalities. Uh, yeah. Richard, we've spoken in the past about uh, two basic personality right. types in medicine. Uh, and I think you said the the show MASH. And for those of you who are younger, MASH was this uh, show set in uh, Korea, Mobile Army Surgical Hospital, and it had these various yeah. personalities, uh, these archetypal uh, personalities. And, and you'd mentioned the, the two basic personality types of doctors, Richard. What, 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 how would you describe them? Well, we, uh, I, I always, this always intrigued me when the show was on. There's, there are two doctors. There's, there's Hawkeye Pierce, the great humanitarian. Humanitarian. It's kind of a do, joker. Do we, yeah, well, to deal with the stress, you know, yeah. it had a certain uh, personality. Which we all there's there's all we all deal with stress differently, okay. And uh, but but he was he was you know he's always trying to do things for the what I would say the right the the, the right reason for the for the person you know right justice humanitarianism the yeah. greater good right and the and they presented the other character that was. Uh, Charles Emerson Winchester, who's Winchester with the British accent, with the right. New England accent, the yes. great with a great education and great talent, but his motivation really is his own ego. Yeah, look you how know. great I am. Yeah, right. You caught me on a good day. So, yeah. <laughs> yes. So what? So w what is the right? It, 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 is there a right motivation to do uh -huh. something difficult to do to take care of somebody who's truly sick? Does it matter what the motivation is? Does it matter if it's you're doing it because you're you think you're great, or are you doing it, or because you want to help this person? You badly want to hurt this help this person. Yeah. You know what? What is the? Does the motivation? Does it matter? And that's more and, of a rhetorical question. And I, and I, don't, I don't know don't, if there's an I, answer. Yeah. I, I don't. Um, I have. You know, as a young. Person before cynicism really sets in. <laughs> you the go, jading oh, the, process. The, 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 <laughs> the humanitarian. Well, yeah, but the humanitarian burns out. You know, yeah. The humanitarian can, yeah. gets gets beat up for other reasons, and uh, and and you know, and can't you know, uh, it starts to withdraw from it, and sure, and, uh, you know, it, uh, uh, you know, everyone I know who does what I do has some. You have to have some ego. You have to think that you're really good at what you're doing or you can't yeah. do it. You yeah, there, there's a joke about surgeons, Richard. If you ask a surgeon who the two greatest surgeons in the world are, yeah. they always have trouble telling you the second name. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that you know, you kind of, you have to have that. You, you kind of you, do. You have, you're going to walk in and do something technically difficult and, important uh that that uh, you you have to you have to be able and 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 it may not go right you know um and you have to be able to your person your person your own person has to survive that in order to be able to help somebody else like, later on right right I so mean, complications are rare in my world but yeah. Boy, if you have one, it really changes your right. your approach. The next case, yes. You know, yes. how do you do it again? But, but do you? But do you? Do you? Do you, uh, you, you know, you, you have to do something hard sometimes to help somebody. And oh, then, it's very and, hard. And if, what that, we do. if that goes badly, or something happens afterwards, how do you go into the next one? 
you know, right? And do it again, and, and you, do it again. You, you know, that's that's the uh, we we all have faced problems where things didn't go well, and we have to f we have to go back in and do the same thing again later on. Yeah, you know, and uh, uh, and 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 technically, you could have done it extremely well the first time. On that on that first person, and had trouble, and uh, just because they're like for what I do, you know, fix something on the heart, but the whole person has to survive that. They right, you know, the brain, the kidneys, the liver, the lungs, the ki kidneys, everything else has to get through it too. You and know? just to and, put a fine point on this, Richard, when you do your a lot of your heart surgeries, they're on a heart lung machine. Right, their their heart is stopped. Yes. If you stopped or you screwed up, they are dead. So you've, you've yeah, got at that moment. You, yeah. At that moment, yeah. So you've got this window, an hour, two, or three, whatever it is, to do yeah. what you have to do, and it has to work because that heart has to restart. And the and the, the machine is, uh, and uh, it's amazing how well the vast majority of people tolerate them being on the heart lung machine. Uh huh. Um, but every once in a while, you know, it. it you know, people don't tolerate it very well. Yeah, you know, and sometimes and, the heart doesn't and you, start. And you can't predict. Well, doesn't I, I've not had that. I've, I've, I've you know, uh, people ask you that. What do you do to restart it? I, I just let the blood go back to the heart, and I've, I've never had the heart not restart. Oh, good uh, for you. Good for it, you. And it, it, uh, and it, it, the heart actually tolerates that whole process very well. Better than the brain. It's, it's. It's everything else that I worry yeah, about, right? And much more so than the, the heart itself. You know the 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 criteria, the the characteristics that we apply to the heart emotionally. Uh, it, you know, don't really. It's not. That's really not what it is. It's it's a yeah. hunk of muscle, and it's pretty damn tough. Yeah. You know. Um, yeah, and what what we call the, the heart might be more vagus and more gut. Yes. Like gut feel. We talk about gut feelings, yeah. uh, and, and that that's my feeling, too. Uh, I get gut feelings. I, I kind of get heart feelings, but I mainly get gut feelings about things. Yeah. When I'm looking for emotional center or feedback or, or um, you know, you know well, well, what's the word I'm looking for, you know? Well, uh, Self-knowledge. You know, as, as an example, two-thirds of the uh, nerve fibers in the vagus nerve are sensory. Ah, you think of the vagus nerves, folks, is that's what drives the digestion and the, your, your, it's your, your guts. Part, part of your autonomic nervous yeah, system. Yeah, it's kind of control. You think of it kind of controlling, but it's actually sensory. Most of it's coming Most back up. Most of it's up. sensory. I didn't two know third, that. Two-thirds of it is sensory. It's, it's feeding what's, back what's, to you. What's it doing? Uh, I don't know. Anybody can really tell me very well. Yeah. Well, there you go. I explain, you know, kind of interesting smell. If you look at olfactory, uh -huh. half of it goes to your lower brain. You don't even know it. Yeah. It goes right to memory and, and, and you don't have, you're not even realizing. Oh, it's, you're it's a strong, this uh, olfactory is the small, the strongest, uh, initiator of memory. Of memory. Yeah. It goes straight in. Yeah. It's the oldest sense too. Yeah. You I mean, just I, swim. I remember, I remember walk, walking oh. through a mall somewhere when I was an adult and then I had this, and I smelled some girl's perfume, and I yeah. all of a sudden I was in high school again. You know, yeah, just, just, just like, like that. that. It, you know, oh, you're yeah. like, oh my goodness, you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but anyway, the the uh, you know so much of uh, the responses that we get from people that we're taking care of, you know, and uh, you know things like histamine and. Um, you know, chemicals in our body that transmit information. I hear a lot of people talk about dopamine that right. that they uh, they doing cold plunges to get their dopamine levels up, and they're they're serotonin uh, and they're ser oxytocin. Yeah, yeah we're, they're, we're, 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 <laughs> there's all this discussion now about neurotransmitters that was that you didn't hear about 10, 15 years ago. You know, yeah, because there's there all. I mean, all those things have been known about. But now it's become part of the popular lingo, you yeah. know, which which it wasn't before, and uh, uh, and I'm kind of intrigued by, you know, the people looking for their dopamine, you know, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, 
you know, in, uh, and other than personal relationships. You, you know, get so many different ways. Apparently that's how uh, crack cocaine gets to the brain. It's a huge dopamine dump. Right. I'm told. But it doesn't last as long as a cold plunge. Yeah, a cold plunge. You can do it again. Yeah. And you don't have these uh, social uh, uh, behavioral problems. Yeah. 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 So is there anything else going on, Richard, that you can recall in, in about your training or some experiences you had that uh, people might want to know about you or about your, your experiences that well, they might find interesting? So I, I spent... Um, well, this is, I don't know that people would find this interesting, but it, uh, I finished uh, nine years at Emory. Uh, nine years at nine Emory. Years at Emory. I, I had a pass to the parking lot that no one, by the time I was done, they rate you by the alphabet. So I was, uh, I think I was a, you know, so you start off, you're an A. Oh, okay. So A, B, C, D, E. Almost everybody's done. Okay. Uh, in the military, like there's E and E6. and Right. So I, I was a, I finished, a, I think I was an H. You were an H. Whoa. Yeah. yeah. I, I I was walking down the hall as a chief resident. I had been there 13 years. I had been there nine years. And here I see a neuro, neurosurgeon walking down the hall and he, He's in a long white coat. He's the chief resident of neurosurgery. He's actually a year behind me. He's actually two years behind me in alphabet speak. Um, so you outranked him. <laughs> well, he, yeah, and he knows. And he, <laughs> he walks up to me, and he's got a tie on. And, you know, this is, they're, you know, obviously well-known people who train there who ended up at CNN. And Oh, CNN, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Uh, I experience. know who this is. So, well... Perhaps. This is a, this actually would have been a resident above him. Okay, so he's walking down the hall, and we're we're good friends from being in the trenches together. And he stops me, and he's got he has an entourage. He's got a couple of medical students, a couple of junior residents walking with him. They're gonna sure they're gonna round with the chief of neurosurgery at Emory, and he stops them, and he approaches me by himself, and he whispers to me, and he says. It does my heart good to see you. He goes, because I know there's someone who's been here longer than me uh, and is working harder than me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. And, and he, he smiles and walks off, you know. Well, what a uh, nice little window of honesty and camaraderie, in fact, oh, and yeah. fellowship. Yeah, yeah to, to say oh, that. He, yes. Well, he was, he was a hardworking, uh, talented guy and... And uh, I was, you know, and I was, he was, I think actually he, when I was on, I was on the trauma team, he was my intern and, and he, he did a great job and, you know, we had that and I didn't abuse him and, and it like can happen. And, um, and so we always had a, a good, good connection. You know, and, boy, uh, he really—he yeah. he must be very self-confident to be able to kind of open yeah, up and he, be honest he, like he that. Was, he was. He was a. Yeah, that, that he was goes, a good guy, and he was very. He knew who he, he knew, knew who he was. was you know. He, yeah. You know, and uh, uh, well, I thought it was funny because he waved off the the entourage. You know, who are to do it in private. Who are, fo who are following? You know, who are all trying to emulate? You know. Sure. And he he separated himself from them to talk to me, which I thought was kind of funny. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, but the 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 uh, you know you you bond with people that you've been through an incredibly stressful situation. Yeah, uh, yeah, we do. And uh, that was kind of what that was a reflection of. You know, was uh, yeah, um, uh, it was a you know so. The, that that training that we went through is uh, that where you're doing 36 hours at a time, you know that that's gone. <clears throat> and, and another thing is the the responsibility we had as a resident. When you we had the private service and the clinic service. Yeah. The clinic service we used to take care of folks that are the poorer folks that didn't have the insurance or the Medicaid right. or whatever. And when you were a resident, they were your patients. Yes. And then you would ask the attending for some help from time to time. But the chief resident was the attending of the clinic service. Correct, yeah. 
And the private patients were all being taken <clears throat> care of by their, their private doctors, and, and you'd help out mm -hmm. uh, in various ways. But that's different now. It's like the attending has to be involved in in, in everything now. Yes. Well, and, and co-sign. And I was here for <laughs> such and such percentage of the procedure, and blah blah blah. So this 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 responsibility, this this uh, fly on your own on the clinic service, seems like it's 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 a thing of the past. Oh yes. Well, I, I, I during the time that I was training, <clears throat> so which was in the nineties. There was I saw the progression. Mm. Um, you know, when I was a uh, when I started, uh, an appendectomy was a, a first year case. Right, right. And, and when I finished, it was a third or fourth year case. You know, I, I was yeah. help. I was helping a. I was a chief resident. I was helping a fourth year take out an appendix, and and the. Uh, and I had an attending surgeon in the room, not scrubbed, but present. And uh, and I and I had the in the fourth year resident was struggling, mm -hmm. uh, just because of it was it was definitely a little difficult. And uh, it was a retrocecal appendix. Uh, That's so right. It's tucked in behind the cecum, so you're gonna have to mobilize part of the colon to get to it. Yes, just for our viewers, sometimes the appendix just sits out. It's real easy to get. Time, sometimes yeah. it's tucked behind. And right. Uh, I, I, and, 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 uh, and he was struggling a little bit. And I, I had already seen what was wrong, and I was just trying to let him work through the problem. And the, uh, But, you know, when I had started, that would have been a first or second year. Okay. You know, that he was actually had his hands on the instruments. And. And by the time I was done, it was, you know, three or four. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. We, you know, since we are, are contemporaries, I remember for gallbladders, they used to do gallbladders through okay, big yeah. incisions. And the attending said, I don't want to even be called until you're at the gallbladder. Yeah. Don't even call me into the room until you're right. there getting ready to do the actual gallbladder yeah. part. You get in, you get, you open, you close. Yeah. Uh, as and that was like a third or fourth year resident, uh, Level so that that's changing and well let let's let's just talk about something that's kind of a, maybe a dirty little secret. Doctors are coming out of training now, sometimes not ready to fly on their own. Well, what, one of the things that I've uh, am intrigued by is the future. Is right because everybody's so focused on uh, minimally invasive, you know. Sure and. Uh, and I, I see this with, in particular, I, I trained with one of the pioneers in uh, endovascular surgery. Okay, that means and going into blood vessels? Go, going through th the vessel instead right. of... Threading uh, things through them. Instead of opening and exposing the vessel. Okay. And, uh, and, for, uh, I, and so some of the open surgery that we did routinely... Is almost completely gone, right? It's not. It's just not done, and but sometimes it it has it needs to be done. You still have to know how to open an abdomen or expose, but people uh, don't a groin or, or an armpit. Pe people don't. They right. You know, they uh, surgeons have been. It's so focused on not doing that that there's very little experience in doing the difficult open parts. Which will come up from yeah. time to time. Still. And I, I was told recently that this the guy who the, the fellow who taught me a lot about doing open surgery and also had started doing endovascular surgery, and it became a huge force in endovascular surgery mm -hmm. over the last twenty five years. Has now started a fellowship for open surgery. Ah. <laughs> it's called a gap, you know. He, he, he flipped it. He, <laughs> he he developed this field, became a pioneer, you know, moved to the top of it, and now he goes, I'm going to jump over here now. Uh, Everybody's uh, doing this. Uh, it's called a gap analysis. I'm going to realize I'm gonna, I'm gonna realize that no one knows how to do this, <laughs> and I'm going to go back, and I'm going to go back to the original you know, and and, and do take some of, another year of people's lives and, 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 to go and, and, back, learn yeah. what you should have learned, what you could have should have learned. Well, if, before, if if ninety percent of the cases are done a certain way, 
where it used to all be done open, you know, the skills are different, you know, and, sure. and uh, uh, so I'm, I'm kind of intrigued by the, you know, some of the things that I do are open, open surgery are difficult. And I, I'm, and I, I think that people will not do them in, in some of it in the future. I think they will do as much as they can with stents and uh, with, uh, uh, endovascular uh, techniques right. and, and minimally invasive techniques, but s some things uh, have to be opened wide up to fix. And I think I, I, I worry that that skill is going to be very limited in availability yeah. in the future. Uh, yeah, these are learning curves, and you sometimes you have to crack a chest, Richard. Yes, yes, yes. So it's... it's uh, uh, you know, the future of, you, you see glimpses of the future, you know, based on, uh, you know, everybody trying to do things uh, without opening someone. And right. uh, uh, that, that routine is gone. And, and uh, uh, so will people stop doing that altogether, you know, and you know, it, it's kind of intriguing to me that what's, what's the future of that? Yeah. Well, you certainly aren't going to be doing many open aortic valve replacements anymore. Uh, doing one tomorrow. Open. Yeah. Well, the reason I mentioned this is we talked to Joss, your partner, and you do them too, where you can take a new aortic valve, sure. thread it up through the groin, put it in there, crush yeah. the old one open, slide in the new one, and yeah. wham a jamma, new but aortic valve. The challenge becomes when that valve that, valve that you... The, the transcatheter valve when it goes bad. Ah. So if it wears out, you know, uh, you can't crush that one open and put a third one in. You got. Well, you you theoretically maybe you, you could put one inside of it. <laughs> we'll find out. But every time you do it, it's getting a little bit smaller. smaller. And then you're you know, and the challenge of removing it. It's got to be oh. done. It's got to be done open. And oh, it sounds frightfully difficult. Now you've got a scarred a whole, foreign body. Oh my a, god! A whole new uh, set of skills uh, wow. are are coming. Again, that's the same thing where somebody out there is gonna, you know, is gonna decide that they're going. You know, you hope that there's someone out there who has a great interest in that and great ability to deal with those problems that. 90% aren't going to want to deal with. You right. Know, and you and people may have to travel to find that skills, that skill set uh, at, at a at a bigger a big institution. Uh, yeah. where there's somebody who is doing a lot of open surgery. Right. Uh, but the Taver stuff it, it Taver is the same thing where it's uh everybody uh nobody wants to be opened. Uh and we don't know we don't know the long-term effects of a taver valve. Uh, they, you know, the uh, really the you, you think you'd have five, ten-year data, but but we live longer than been that. Five, well, the first group of patients that were studied is called the Partner One trial. I think they averaged eighty-eight or eighty-nine years old, and they were deemed not surgical candidates. Ah. So they were. They had a number of other medical problems. They were not going to be operated on by anybody. It was almost compassionate use in a way. It right. Was so all you could do. It reduced. It substantially reduced the mortality of not doing anything. Uh, Twenty percent reduction in mortality, but they still had you know forty percent one year mortality from whatever uh, combination of things was ailing them. Well, they have a number of other medical problems and you, you have fixed one of them. Right. Uh, and so the second group was, I believe, 83. And that was called the intermediate uh, risk. And 83 years old. That was the Not second, 1983, second group. but 83 years old 83 average. years old. So the first group, 88, 89. So I would suspect that there's not a whole lot of those patients left alive. Now, today. Interesting. So it's still uh, so a work ten, in progress. There is no tenure data because uh, for other reasons. They You're doing it people that aren't going to live 10 years. 10 years usually. Right. 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 Uh, and then 83 was the second group, and now and the third group is 77. So it's working down. And so the 77-year-old group is now about five years out. Uh, so we don't have, we don't know what tenure data looks like 
in a low risk patient. Um, and, uh, cause it doesn't, it hasn't been 10 years. Um, only right. time will tell. So that, that, that's data. It's with right. called phase four studies still you're, ongoing. You're, wait, you're waiting to find out. So what do I right. tell someone who comes to me at, at 58 and tells me I don't want to be opened? Right, with a traditional I've heard aortic I valve. I've heard I don't have to it's, have open surgery. You can just stick this in a blood vessel. And I'm like, oh, right. I don't want to do it. You know, I, I know I can do it right through an open Procedure that I've been doing uh, for th decades. Thousands of patients. Right. Long, good long-term results. Uh, what do I do when this guy wants something that I don't know how it's going to turn out? I don't. I know he's going to do great for a year. Right. And then become someone else's problem. Well, potentially. Yeah, that's that's one way to look at it. Is, well, that's what know, some surgeons do, uh, and that's yeah. what insurance well, companies do. Or, or you know, yeah, yeah, is. Uh, is uh, how are we going to time out on this? Right. You know? I mean, uh, you know, so I, so I have great reluctance to, when I see someone who has a lot of life expectancy left. Right. I'm, I, I have to, and, and, and I find myself arguing with people now. <laughs> but <laughs> Not what, cracking. What, just arguing. I mean, it's, it, it's easier for me to, it's easier for me just to put the damn valve in. Right, you, know, you could be just done uh, with yeah, this. Okay, yeah. you want that? Okay, I'll do that. Sure. You know, and I find myself going, you, you ought to get this. You ought to get the hard one. You know, well, you ought to do something hard. Yeah, you know, so you're not oh, fully I jaded. Do, I don't want to do something hard. Oh, right. I want right. you to, you know. Uh, yeah, well, we, I think we see that in all medicines, particularly in my world. You got to do something hard to, to have a baby. And yes, they, they want a yeah. magic pill sometimes. And yeah, I don't, can I don't have it. Me, can you just give me a shot? Right. And I'll have a child. Yeah. And I, I can imagine. Uh, right. Yeah. You know, and, and I, you know, uh, and, you know, and you, you're telling somebody who's 70, you got, a, you got, a, you know, long way to go here, you know? Yeah. Especially a healthy 70 year old. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you know, you got 20 good years left in you. Potentially. With a good aorta. Yeah, and, and you, 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 you really want me just to put this in? Although it might, you know. Yeah, it might. The best, ex you know, uh, who was it? Uh, they they put a tavern valve in Mick, in Mick Jagger. Oh, Mick Jagger had a tavern. 75 years old, got a tavern. And he's still uh, touring. The, <laughs> it's he, always, he's, it's he's, like, he's, <laughs> it's been five years. It's, he's 80. Right, it's always the the last tour. I mean, the, with the Eagles, it was hell freezes they, they, over. Right, they, they still... tried. They tried to taver uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger. They did. It, it, that's a that's a very long story. But um, they tried to taver him, and I think they ended up doing open surgery. And they did open, and then they he ended went up lifting. doing difficult open surgery. Difficult, and then he lifted weights like three days later and busted it open. No, I that think. was that was the original. Uh, the operation. first one he popped. Open. I, I don't think he lifted weights, but he he. He did have problems years ago with a complex operation that was done. Interesting. Uh, but yeah. when that that wore out, what they had done at that time wore out. They tried to taver him. They tried to do something minimally invasive, he, but they had people on standby in case it didn't work. And, I see. And the rumor is that he ended up with open surgery. So that's the rumor. I don't yeah, know, we I know we nothing. can neither confirm nor deny. I know yeah. nothing else about that other than yeah. I, I believe he got open surgery. Wow. So, uh, um, so but, to, but it's but it's it's very you know it's very the advertisements are all pushing you know uh, there's there's no motivation to to advertise old technology even right. if it's better right you know um, you know for right. you know what, what was you know uh, years ago they came up with an intravenous ibuprofen yeah. But it's yeah, gen, it's, it's just gen, Advil. But there's no reason to do research on it because there's no financial gain. Yeah, and they had for a while intravenous Tylenol. So they instead of do. taking instead of taking a you know a twelve cent Tylenol, it was like I don't know how much it was a hundred thousand dollars for a <laughs> what it was. It was very expensive for intravenous Tylenol. It was, it was uh, administering a, a shot at our hospital was twenty dollars for one shot. Of IV Tylenol. Of IV Tylenol was only twenty dollars. Okay, it was twenty dollars. But it was pennies. The drug, the drug was probably only seven or eight. But to actually 
get it to the right. floor and administer it. Right. So they took it off the formula because they didn't want to spend the money. Right. But I will it. tell you, it was great. Ah. So you have that patient who doesn't tolerate uh, other pain medicines, narcotics or other things because of nausea uh. or seeing things or other things. Oh, I loved IV Tylenol. I thought really? That was a great medicine. Uh, and and if, you, if you had reserved it for the people who didn't tolerate other medicines, you know. It would have been a balance between been cost. It would have been, and, right, it would have been right. good. But we, it was taken off our firm there because of cost. You know, they're like a... <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> They're like, how good can an IV? How much better can IV Tylenol be over just oral Tylenol? Well, but sometimes I will tell it you, is. I will tell you that it was very effective. I was very pleased to use it, uh, and I was very disappointed when it came off the formula. It was yeah. that is a very good medicine. Interesting. And, and uh, uh, you know, but it did. It cost you know twenty times as much as uh, as a pill. Uh, yeah. And uh, uh, anyway, yeah. So to start connecting the dots and maybe uh, wrapping this up logically, let's say uh, motivations for going into medicine and surgery will probably always be there. We'll always have these archetypes of personality. Yes, I believe that. And you know, I, I I bought my practice from a guy named Dr. Larry Penny. He passed away recently. We were very different in so many ways, politics being the most famous way. But I'll be damned, we weren't 99% the same when it came to excellence and professionalism <laughs> and wanting to help people and how to do it. Yes. I mean, that, that was the common thread, yeah. uh, to which I'm very proud that, that, that well, we he, shared. He had quite the work ethic. And the work ethic, oh my yeah. God. Yep. I found yep. you'd find him in the doctor's lounge. Anytime. Day or night, getting ready to do something. I mean, yeah. the reason you do fertility in part is so you don't have to be up all night delivering babies, and he still chose to do that too. You yeah. do C-sections on quadruplets, and yeah, he, he was, yeah. yeah. I, just, man, I just remember so. walking in and, you know, and to see a, you know, to see a gynecologist in the waiting for an operating room at three in the morning, it was kind of like, yeah. I always wondered, what could that be? You know, well, but that I, was the yeah. obstetrical part of his of his yeah. training that he never let go of. Yeah, um, yeah, but but as 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 you've modified what he did, yeah, you know, uh, the same thing is true of the generations following us. Is that they modify to what? You know the way they're going to practice, you know, and and they're not going to, uh, uh, you know, they're not going to. They they haven't been trained to do the hours and the continuousness. They're going to, they're going to protect themselves more. There's yeah. all this discussion of work life balance, and they're right. going, they're going to be more conscious of that than. And, and, and it's going to be different. It's just going to be different. You know? And it's going to be an ongoing debate whether that diminishes their, their skills and whether they do need another it's, few years of hand-holding after training, after all those years of training. Yeah. Uh, do they still need some hand-holding? That's the best word for it, perhaps, uh, until they're really, really ready to fly on their own. Right, right. And they have those skills that maybe they would they didn't learn and, and, you know, how much time is there in life to, to spend in training? I mean, you get out when you're 50 or 60 years old, ready to go. I mean, uh, well, I mean, they're, they're constantly trying to find ways. There's a lot of emphasis, like in cardiac, because it's so long, to shorten it. Um, right. And, and now they have programs that are, instead of the nine years that I did, they're six. Um, and I'm sure there are incredibly talented people with good hands and good judgment that might do okay with six. Right. But there's some that won't. And, yeah. and that, that debate's the same in uh, reproductive endocrinology. Do you need uh, four years of OBGYN and then three years of fellowship? I, I only did two years of fellowship. It was two years when I trained, and that was just fine. Yeah. 
Um, and now there's a shortage of reproductive endocrinologists. By the way, is there a shortage of, cara- of cardiothoracic surgeons? Terrible. Terrible shortage. Terrible. So we have to balance this work, work-life balance versus the, the need for competent so surgeons. It, it, it's, it's purely, uh, you know, do you want to work that hard? And uh, it's all about pay. Pay, yeah. And it's yeah. particularly if a physician uh, extender, yeah. there are wonderful nurse practitioners. Uh, I, I train uh, physician assistants, yeah. and they do a great job when it's a, a routine case. Right. And they get compensated, I believe, fairly well. Yes. Uh, but but you, when you're not the routine case, then then you need a, perhaps a wise old uh, – <laughs> Surgeon to, to figure it out, trusty to, to, to trust the old, so there you go, uh, to do the difficult uh, cases. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so it's going to be a constant trade-off. So I don't see that debate getting any easier, Richard. No, no, it's, it's uh, uh, yeah, it, definitely, you know, when I, I have not looked at this in several years, but um, about 10, 15 years ago, the there were 120 spots in the country to train to be a heart surgeon. 120. Uh, and at the, at the time that I looked at this, there were they were they were training. They were averaging 67 a year. Graduating, yes. 67. Right. So, and when I applied for my spot, well, there were two applicants for every spot. Okay. So there were, and the spots all filled. So there's 240 people applying, 120 people picked. Okay. And that has gone to, that went to less than half the spots, or just barely half the spots filling. Oh, so there's now more spots than applicants. Right. So 120 spots, 67 people finishing. Uh, I don't know what it is in the last five years, but uh, I, it's very difficult. We've been trying to find someone to come here. Uh, a third partner for you. Right. So, right. so my approach, looking for a job, I, this, uh, my approach was, do you have cases for me to do? Is there enough work? Uh, and, the, and, and this is not just cardiac surgery. Now the first question is, how much call do I have to do? Right. You know? Uh, right and and, and you know how many weekends, right? How many weekends a month, you know, uh, do am I going to do? You know, and, right? And everybody wants to be the fourth or fifth guy. Nobody wants to be the second or third guy, right? You know, because right. because that, that's more call, more obligation. Sure, and in and my field too, they only make forty reproductive endocrinologists every year. I'm sure that many retire. And this happens to be on a Sunday, Richard. We're doing this uh, interview, yeah. and I've been up all morning doing egg retrievals, yeah. embryo transfers, and whatnot. Uh, it's That's just right. another day for me. Well, I, I saw 14 people in the hospital this morning, wow. Sunday, on a Sunday, and did a two-hour operation. You know, and right. And, uh, uh, you know, so and I did an op- I operated yesterday on Saturday. Right. Uh, you know, and and this. Coming week is fall. So, you know, we've, we've got, there's plenty of work. Uh, and, uh, um, but again, it's, it's uh, you know, I, I was attracted to a, a smaller community in between two large communities, you know. Right. We live in a, in a university town, about 120,000 here, uh-huh. about a half a million catchment area. Yeah. Whereas most uh, most people are looking for a larger program because sure more support more less call and uh, more palm trees and sometimes warmer yes the Florida's big draw there's a lot of heart surgeons in Florida so yeah um, you know all my friends trained in Atlanta all went to all ended up in Florida uh-huh. you know and uh, right uh, close to their sailboats and sure yeah. So I think uh, we can predict that in all fields, um, uh, we're going to have a doctor shortage. Yes. And how how yeah. the country deals with it is going to depend on a lot of things. 
It's going to depend on the work ethic of people applying. It's going to depend on the motivation of people to are they going to are are smart, hard working people going to gravitate to these very difficult jobs that I don't see right. getting any easier? No, it's not getting any easier. And as our country gets older, the demand will only go up. Yes, and and expectations go higher. Yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. If you have a complication, that that's like right. well, that we, you know, it's said, Richard. If you don't have complications, you're not doing enough cases. I mean, that's the standard yeah. answer. Yeah, if you don't, uh, yeah. The way I was taught to me was, if if you if you don't want complications, don't do surgery. Don't do surgery, right? <laughs> you know, right. And you even do your just best. Stay at home, <laughs> right? Exactly. <laughs> Advise other people. Write a paper. <laughs> <laughs> Become a consultant. Yeah. <laughs> or as I see ads on TV, you go to law school and then become a a, a, a lawyer that uh, sues doctors for a living. Yes. Uh, a friend of mine was involved in a lawsuit, and he was fairly frustrated by the whole process. And uh, uh, part of the reason he was so frustrated is he's very bright, and he he wouldn't he he wouldn't just listen to his attorneys, okay, and do what they said. And he was trying to enforce his own will on the process, which was not working. Not smart. And uh, and he a very smart, busy guy uh, who had a very successful practice, and uh, and he he said to one of the attorneys in the process of all this, he goes, you know, after because it, it, it just it tears your you know, it, it's such yeah. a part of your identity that when you're accused yeah. of wrongdoing, it pulls your guts out. Oh, it pulls your guts out. Yep. Yeah, and he he said I. He looked at one of the attorneys at one point in the middle of this whole process and said, I guess I, I should be doing what you guys are doing. And the guy goes, don't. Don't. <laughs> he goes, don't. He goes, you help people. You you do some serious good. He goes, he goes this whole thing is just a game. Don't. He goes, don't. Uh, don't. You, you're letting this uh, cloud your, cloud you, your emotional, uh, your emotions are clouded by the process and uh, uh, he goes he goes you actually do some good don't don't let this uh, hurt you you know yeah yeah and uh, I think he uh, he settled down after that that this guy had kind of reassured him that he was probably doing what he was supposed to be doing yeah you know, I, see I feel fortunate because I feel like I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing you know and, yeah I do and, too uh, I feel it's a calling uh, yeah uh, <clears throat> Vocation, it's the you know my yeah. father called it. That's what my father called it. Right? Vocation, vocation. He That's liked more he liked than that. that. Yeah, uh, when I was struggling with what to do, uh, I was in engineering and I was not enjoying it. And uh, my, I had dinner with my father, and he said, "What about going to medical school?" And I had, I kind of totally written that off. This. And he, he just kind of replanted the seed, you know. And, uh -huh. and uh, uh, I was working at an engineering company, and I had helped design a computer box for that went on a, a F fourteen uh, Tomcat. Okay. And uh, uh, my boss, a very enthusiastic engineer, comes to me and he goes, "The redesign is finished. They've built one." Okay, he goes. They're shipping it out uh, today on the loading dock. He goes, let's go watch it go out. Ah, he, he was so excited. Sure, almost he christening goes, the ship. They got the champagne. He goes, yeah, and the it, you know it, the box is only. You know, it's, <laughs> it goes under the seat. Yeah, they got to yeah. be small, right? Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. And he goes, uh, you. Uh, he goes, let's go watch it ship it out. I was like, no. <laughs> He's like. Why did I go? I, I don't care that they're putting it on the uh, on a. They're sticking. They're going to stick a this box in the back of a van. It's going to drive away. You know, it's it's not like the uh, shuttle. But thing. he, but your boss oh, he was appreciated. So, he it. was so excited. He saw about the it. meaning. Well, it it pointed out to me that I was in the wrong thing. Yeah, you know, because I could see his eyes lit up about this box going out the back door. Wow. You know, and that the design had been finished and was successful, 
and it's it's they're going to go put it on a plane somewhere. Yeah, and and you're going to find out if it actually works. What you did works, and I was like, mm. you know, I had no, yeah. I could just tell. I just had no enthusiasm for it. I, I did for the doing the design, and I actually drove out to a naval base and climbed into a plane so I could see where the or so I see where the box sat. Did it work? You know, was and the it box was it well it worked, designed. It, it was. It worked. It cooled much better. Kept overheating, but it was sitting on the tarmac, and uh, uh, and and I. But I was like, I, I mean, I enjoyed what I did, but I was like, I had no enthusiasm for it. Not like that. I was right. watching him light up. Hey, the box is going out today. You know, and I was like, <laughs> you know. I, now, now you get to see Mr. and Mrs. Smith going out the door yeah. with a repaired well, heart. You know, every once in a while, you know, you, you feel like, am I am I really doing any good? I mean, we all, you know, you, you, you get presented with people bringing their children yeah, back. Yeah, they're little babies. And, yep, yeah. yep, baby pictures. Yeah, and, 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 and so... Uh, I, I was standing in the lobby yesterday, and a gentleman stopped me. And he goes, uh, you did my heart surgery two years ago. I'm doing great. Shook my hand. Nice. You know, and that that's just that's just huge. It, it, it you know, I was, you know, I was, uh, I was about to go see my 10th new patient in two days. And I was getting a little bit like, oh, this this train, has, this train yeah. has to slow down a little bit, right? You know, and you but you realize you do help people, you know, and uh, they benefit, and uh, uh, and so it's it, you know, and it's it, what the work suits me. So uh, I feel very fortunate to have that, uh, and uh, and, and now I'm. You mentioned it earlier. Uh, slightly paranoid about. When do you stop? You know, right? You, you want to stop before someone asks you to stop. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah, right, you, right. you don't. You don't. You, you, you might you, want to retire. Yeah, you don't ever want to. You don't want there ever to be a question of the yeah. like. Like, um, do you want a breath mint? Well, maybe. Right, right, right. Yeah. You don't turn that down. Yeah, a friend of mine tells a great story of that. He's, uh, he's on a shuttle at the airport, and. The husband turns to the wife uh, 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 sitting across from him, and he goes, do you have a breath mint? And she goes, sure. And she starts digging through her purse, and she pulls one out. She goes, okay, now take it. Ah! <laughs> 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 and, that's, and that's why I parked my car by myself. You know, <laughs> I drop my wife at the at the, at the the terminal, and I don't. You, you know, go park it. But I would, I would have been that bold. But it was like. Mm -hmm. I, I, yeah, he tells that story. I thought, that, I thought that was one of the funniest things. Uh, <laughs> I'm so glad I wasn't sitting there because I would, I would have been spitting up, laughing, you know, <laughs> trying, trying not to show her that, I, you know, uh, I, you know. Anyway, yeah, honesty is a uh, is not easy sometimes, yeah. Richard. Yeah. Well, listen, I I have really enjoyed talking to you. Uh, I've enjoyed you, you you sharing some of your stories. Uh, I'm glad you told us about about. How training used to be for us, uh, where medicine is going, uh, where where some needs are, and uh, maybe people start having a little compassion for the heart surgeon who's been up uh, all well, night. I, I learned I learned a long time ago, and, and and somebody said this to me when I was, and, and I've heard it like in three different things. No one ever feels bad for a heart surgeon. Interesting, and they, and they were talking about. Uh, Reimbursement. Oh right, 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 right. <laughs> but it right. applies to so many things, you know. Yeah, sure does. That that it's like, uh, you know, uh, yeah. If, no one ever feels bad for a heart surgeon. You no sympathy. No, you just have to, you know, bear you, it. You bear it, and you soldier on. Yeah. Well, soldier, thank you for your time. Sure. What a pleasure talking to you, Richard. Thanks for being so much, such a wonderful resource for our community. And thank you for being such a wonderful colleague and friend. Oh, no problem.